Well, I don't know about you all, but I grew up watching The Wizard of Oz. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this iconic movie. I think it's almost everyone. Okay, we're going to have to help out some younger folks here. You, they need to see it. It's a classic. Okay. I grew up with this whole story of Dorothy and the journey with her friends. And, you know, one of the key moments of suspense, if you have watched the movie, you might remember. If you haven't seen it, close your ears. I'm going to spoil it for you. Okay? The man behind the curtain is revealed, and Dorothy and her friends are told to pay no attention to him. He was really the great, great Oz himself. You know, that is, he engineered his, his kind of magnified image and his larger-than-life voice to be more impressive than he was actually in person. Now, it's kind of a, a comparison, but over the years, I have begun to see kind of behind the curtain of this curious church, the United Methodist Church, to which I'm bound. No, it's not that there's one man or one woman behind the curtain running a projector and a sound system, but there are things that go on in the background that paint a bigger picture for the world to see. You know, I never knew about what that word conference meant when I was growing up in this denomination, except I knew that the preacher went to it, and sometimes someone else preached that Sunday, and then often, or not always, but every four years or so, we'd get a new preacher, and the old one would pack up and move away. I didn't understand the terms charge conference, annual conference, jurisdictional conference, general conference. But when I was in the ordination process, it became my business to learn a little bit more about these conferences and participate in them. They all have different functions in the Methodist Church, but they all serve one underlying purpose. And that's to remind us that we are in this together and that our relationship to each other, it really matters. This connectionalism was brought home to me years ago at the first annual conference that I ever attended. I was uh, getting on the trolley and that was a transportation from the parking lot to the big auditorium. And the first person I met on the trolley was a man named Reverend Ship. And when I asked him about the only other person I knew with that last name, turned out it was his son, Aaron Ship, who had been a friend of mine years earlier and I'd kind of lost touch with. Well, I chatted with both the ships about their son. We got off the trolley and we went our separate ways. Now, I learned later on, sadly, in that year that Reverend Ship passed away. And that made that conversation all the more meaningful in my mind. Back when I was doing a lot of supply preaching, this connectionalism stood out as I spent time with other churches, and I made even more friends across the conference. And at all of these churches, the familiarity was unmistakable, even, even if the liturgy and the music selections varied. And even across denominational lines, there is a connection with the rest of this family of God even if we occasionally have a, an Uncle Crazy in the bunch that no one wants to claim. Now, the disciples had a connection as well. They had a deep connection with Jesus during his earthly ministry. How hard it must have been for them to contemplate and to understand what Jesus so gently told them in the weeks leading up to his arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection. I want you just to listen and note the tenderness in this short passage from John 16. John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many, many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So today's Trinity Sunday. You know, as Christians, there are special times of year like Advent and Christmas and Lent and Easter. 
Last week was a third of those celebrations, Pentecost. And Jesus, in this passage, talks about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, also like we did last week at Pentecost. Now, the concrete events, birth, resurrection, and the visible and audible signs at Pentecost, they're relatively easy for us to understand. But today, we are asked to wrap our minds, our limited human minds, around a concept, something that's not so easy to visualize or articulate. So I'm going to show you a funny little video that I see every year, and I decided to share it with you this year that it kind of makes light at our attempts to understand the concept of the three-in-one God, but it does have a point, so watch this with me. So far, not very funny, is it? Here we go. <laughs> Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms. Liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star, and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an apple. Partialism revisited. Fine, the Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, <laughs> quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. Okay, there was some truth in that. Might have made you smile just a little bit if you could understand their thick Irish brogues. But, you know, it's really hard to explain the Trinity. And like it said in this little video, you know, you say, sometimes you hear people say it's three forms of water, vapor, ice, and liquid. Or, or like a tree, you know, the root and the trunk and the branches. 
But these analogies just don't quite hit the mark, do they? Well, the deeper question might be, well, why does it even matter that we understand this concept, if we understand the Trinity, the way that we understand the birth of Jesus and his resurrection? Does it? It's no wonder that this confusing concept has stupefied others when they look at Christianity from the outside. We can't fully explain it ourselves as insiders, despite our repetition of it in our affirmations of faith, in our prayers, and in our doctrines. There's, this is a lot more complex than understanding the difference between annual, general, and jurisdictional conferences. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Can you hear the tenderness in those words that Jesus says to his disciples? Now just imagine, they were probably pretty shaken up and worried about how things were going. The words that Jesus had shared with them about his coming path, that road to Jerusalem, the road to the cross. Like a gentle parent, Jesus says, Shush, don't worry, you will understand in time. Perhaps like me, you might remember a mom or a dad or a grandparent saying to you, Shush, child, you will understand in time, or you will understand when you have children of your own. Hush, Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, you will be guided into all truth. You don't need to bear this now. It seems to be a very broad, practiced human concept that we like to explain everything, everything. But Jesus left a lot unsaid when the disciples struggled to wrap their minds around the way their three-year mission was coming to a close. And it does remind me a little bit of the land of Oz from the book and the movie. And yes, even that amusement park that I think is open just maybe a few weeks a year now in the mountains of North Carolina. I went there as a child too. One of the basic precepts of this land of Oz is that there was a power that was hidden and controlled things and made it all work out. It reminds me of the structure of the United Methodist Church. There are decisions made by the bishop and all the district superintendents that I don't know about firsthand. Appointments are made, ministry supports are launched, like during this past couple of years when our conference gave financial assistance to churches during the pandemic to try to help to relieve some of the burdens of ministry, expenses like pensions and upgrades to church campuses and help with technology. Also, this whole petition process at annual conference, that's when groups of people bring together an idea that they propose that will benefit the work of the church. Now, I've read a good bit about what is happening in our larger connection, but I just don't have the time or the bandwidth to read, digest, and understand everything completely. What I do know, however, is that I trust the bishops that we elect I trust our district superintendent. I trust the process by which delegates are elected to general conference where decisions are made. I don't have to intricately understand every single action. The connection provides checks and balances as a larger entity so that on the local level we can focus on the main thing, which is to love God, to care for each other, and serve the world. The transformational work we do has many moving parts. Now, other denominations have similar but maybe slightly different processes in their doctrine and their polity, how they do things. I'm partial to the workings of the people called the Methodists, and that's from my own inside view. But our connection provides accountability. And I also know that with a single call or email, I can have a whole team of people at my disposal to help me and this church through any difficulty or question or situation we may find ourselves in. It may be the district superintendent or conference staff that lends a hand, but help is easy to access. At Marvin, some of you know firsthand we've made good use of resources like the Lending Library for Sunday School and VBS material. Another thing that matters to me is our connectedness. 
person to person, church to church, district to district, conference to conference. We work together to focus on how we love God and how we care for each other and how we serve the world. And this modeled connectedness can be seen even if we don't really understand it completely in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. You know, behind the curtain, Dorothy found out that Oz was really one small man making good use of technology to amplify his actions. And behind the curtain of denominational churches, we see the workings of a great number of people who together turn the wheels of the church. Our efforts, efforts are amplified because we work together for one cause, and that cause is to share God's love in real, concrete ways, to transform communities that are disjointed and unconnected, to reach where people are isolated and sometimes literally starving, sometimes starving for human connection. When we pay our apportionments, part of this payment not only supports the resources that we have available to us on a local level, but it also allows us to pool our resources with thousands of other churches, big and small, to make a big difference in the world. It's a vivid example of following that great commission, which tells us to go into all the world. These transformations that happen they're no less magical than what Oz could summon. Transformational communities see the needs of others and sometimes place them above their own needs. Our connectedness yields the strength, the kind of strength it takes to tackle the big issues like poverty and hunger, crime and racism, bigotry in all its forms, and the abuse of unchecked power. Now, the Trinity can't really be explained in a meme or a bumper sticker like we'd like for it to. But we are freed from the responsibility to find the perfect analogy or metaphor for what it means to worship a God who is three persons in one. The Trinity is a holy mystery, a picture of relationship and oneness that we can emulate in our relationships with each other and with this very God we can hold to the promise of the Redeemer who tells us, no worries, you will understand in time. Just trust in me. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit who will lead you to the fullness of truth by and by. Even as we recognize that we may not fully understand what Trinity means, we can learn more about the nature of the God we worship and how we are connected to this diverse communal, dynamic, hospitable, and loving God. Why care about the Trinity or the behind-the-scenes working of our United Methodist Church? Well, because we are children of a triune God, a God who wants to gently guide us into the arms of the Spirit of Truth. We are also members joined together in ministry in this church and in our district, our conference, and with churches around the world. Belonging, it matters. In that we share with Dorothy, being a part of something greater than ourselves, broader than our own understanding, makes it possible for a space that is more grace-filled than we could ever imagine. There truly is no place 